We even give instructions on how to prepare. But there are many other things playing a part in it this time, including the alien issue. Now, what's your background and what led you to um, come up with the book? I have, well, I had a near-death experience as a child at age nine. And maybe that led me to want to know everything from the deepest level. But I, I've always had this curiosity. Anything metaphysical, spiritual, um, knowledge of the deepest levels, you know, in the 60s as a kid. I read Edgar Cayce, Ruth Montgomery, Jean Dixon, and anything else that I could find at the time, which wasn't a whole lot, not nearly as much as now. But I was, I've always been gifted with incredible synchronicities coming through my life. Meetings with key people with in-depth knowledge, including some of the original remote viewers who had 28 degrees of top-level secrecy above the president. And everything has, you know, conspired to paint a clear scenario of what's happening and why. Um, I could start out with explaining what my remote viewer friend had told me. Yes, I'm very interested in that. And he, can you mention his name? Was it Ingo? I'd ra it wasn't Ingo that I do know Ingo, and I have a picture with Ingo. But I don't know that I should mention his name, or if you want that. But um, he would be led through room after room in a top secret facility, in through rooms, through rooms, and then he'd get to a room full of aliens of different species. He said there were many different races, and some he, he Did he said, mention any? Mention the names of the races. No, he did not. But he did say that some were ugly as hell, to quote, to quote him. And he also said that some would be working at computers, which really fascinated me. And he had never really thought about that. He thought they were just entering things in. But uh, their presence was well known among his level of people. Um, and, you know, along with the implication that they are here for a definite purpose, which is what I found out when I actually met Dan Fry, the contactee from the 50s, who was on the White Sands Missile Base, and then eventually met an alien friend of his. Can you go into that? Sure. Um, I got 1977. I had studied Rudolf Steiner formally for two years in, from 74 to 76. Steiner was an immensely gifted clairvoyant, even more so than possibly than Edgar Cayce because he was consciously clairvoyant. Anyway, I, I met a friend from the Steiner Waldorf Institute between trains in Boston, and she said she had seen an aura balancing place in New Mexico. So eventually I decided to go out there. I came into town and because I have a little degree of clairvoyance myself, I could see UFOs having been in that area, having a they, strong They left a residue of some kind that you could see that they'd been there? I could see that they had been there. I could see their presence coming down in those hills and that they had strong activity in the area. Now at the time, I was in my early 20s. I knew nothing about Alamogordo, New Mexico. Since then I found out that the White Sands Missile Base has, uh, is known for secretive dealings with UFOs. But, so I came into town and I had this vision sort of, if you call it that, but this was a time, this was 1977, this was a time when the whole subject was still very laughable due to disinformation. So I brought it up very carefully with the people I was staying with. Asked them if they knew of anyone who's had an encounters in the area. And to my delight, they not only knew of someone, they knew personally Dan Fry, a contactee, and they said he wrote of his account. Well, I was ecstatic. Back then, you couldn't find accounts. 
So I couldn't get them to bring out his books fast enough. I consumed them. I read them in a day and a half. Now they're published as one called New Two Men of Earth. Um, then I um, was going on to Phoenix, but I asked them if he's still living in the area because I really wanted to meet him. I wanted to, I was dying to talk with him in person about what it was like to meet an alien and what they had said. Well, I was c completely devastated when they said he no longer lived in the area, but in the very next second, I was elated because they said he moved to Phoenix. My next stop was Phoenix. He was living outside of Phoenix in Tonopah, Arizona, in an intriguing community of circular buildings with UFO roofs. And he said that the idea was that they'd be camouflaged if any wanted to land. I have pictures in my book of that community. Wonderful. Anyway, I got, I got into town, into Phoenix, dropped my bags, and immediately got on the phone to Dan Fry. I introduced myself. Of course, times were much simpler then. You could trust people then. I said, I've just stayed with your friends in Alamogordo, and I'd love to come talk with you. And he said in the voice of a grandfather, why, sure, we've got plenty of room. Come up for the weekend. So this was on a Thursday. I, the next morning, Friday, I was hopping a bus to Tonopah, Arizona. The short end of it is I got to be friends with Jan, and we ended up, I spent several weekends with him and Florence, his wife, while he would explain, I would help him. He was the only one who had a magazine that sort of was open to these issues. It was called Understanding Magazine. And I would help him attach labels and bundle them up for the subscriptions while he told me stories, tremendous stories, of what it was like to meet the aliens. And can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, they had initially convinced him that they were here for the good of humanity, that there was something tremendous happening in our future and their presence was needed. They needed to come and live incognito as human beings. And Dan was either the first or one of the first who helped them get false IDs, false papers, um, and jobs, you know, in human clothing. Oh, that is fascinating. Yeah. Um, they communicated for four years before the first alien actually came down. And I'm not quite clear if he met others, but for sure what he said was that once the, the initial one was able to come and get all the papers and everything and blend in as a human getting a job, they sort of took it from there and came down on their own. So how do they blend in? Did they shape shift or were they just <clears throat> looking like humans or what? They, they looked completely like humans, completely like humans. And Dan said, interestingly, that the first one who came down, his name was spelled Alan, pronounced Alan. He got Alan a job as a trader in the Mideast. He wanted to be over there to sort of ha have a handle on things, to interject peaceful thoughts wherever he could. Anyway, for the first four years, they communicated telepathically. And, excuse me, it was very important to them. Their request, their first request was to get them as many books from the base library on as many diverse topics as possible. Um, they, you know, cultures, civilizations, languages, history, mathematics, you name it, everything, geography. However, this was so fascinating. The most intriguing book to them was our Bible. And they said that their ancestors were the ones who most often played the part of angels, were called angels in the Bible. And actually, the Greek word for angel means emissary or messenger, which is exactly what they've been. Messengers of the light, of the force of good. God, whatever you want to call it. Um, they mentioned several things in the Bible 
and explained them. One was where it says, in the end times, two brothers will be sleeping. One will be taken and one will not. Referred to the time when this great transition happens, which their presence was needed for, to help with, um, there will be a tremendous transition where you need to have a level of awareness and frequency to go to the next level. There will be a split in realities. Those who still need the opportunity to grow and evolve on this physical plane will be given that opportunity. And to them, it may look like devastation. The rest of us will be taken. And that's what, it, that's what that passage meant, they said. No matter how close you may be in proximity to someone else, if you're not of the right awareness level or frequency, you will not be going. How do we attain that awareness? What does one do to get to that level? Okay. If you haven't got there already. Right. Um, this, as I see it, has been the tremendous effort of all the different multidimensional beings who have been living among us incognito. You know, I see them as a great force behind the New Age movement either inspiring or perhaps writing some of these books, creating some of these movements, maybe inspiring or helping to create, for instance, the Hands Across America, Hands Across the World. All these movements which have eventually, and very quickly really, awakened a lot of people. And this a tremendous awakening, they said, was very necessary because this transition will be unlike any others that have happened throughout the past. My book, Exploring Sacred Space, starts out with some of my classes. Um, I studied formally at the Waldorf Teacher Training Institute, Rudolf Steiner. My professor was clairvoyant. And one day he showed a graphic lasting 25,920 years. He explained that at either end of this roughly 26,000 year cycle, all throughout history, there has been a cosmic alignment which has created catastrophes on Earth. That roughly every 13,000 years, there's been a major cataclysm where most of humanity has died and the few remaining would have to start over at a much more primitive level. But this time, he said, this time is unique, perhaps in the whole universe, which is why all these multidimensional beings want to come and live among us, to help with this and be a part of it and witness it. Witness it. Um, this time there will be this multi-dimensional multi shift. And it is very important that not all of humanity dies. It is very important that we make it alive this time to this new dimension. How is that achieved? Of course, we don't know. None of us know the in-depth details, but I'm able to give details that no one has been able to give, you know, as many details as I can. It, he started this class in an intriguing way. Of course, he was from Britain. He, well, he wasn't from Britain, but he had a British accent. He was born in Austria. Werner Glass was his name. He had the profile of Alfred Hitchcock, spoke with an incredibly deep voice, dramatic British accent, and dark eyes that just pierced into your soul. Literally, I'm sure he could see our past lives. And he said some very amazing things to some of the students. But anyway, he began this class by saying, we are living at a time of Noah. And then he stared out at us dramatically and took these dramatic pauses. And of course, we had no idea what he meant. And he went on to explain, there is going to be a major uh, cataclysm, a major event happening this time. He, I asked him when he showed us this wheel that 13,000 years ago was the last cataclysm. I asked, what happened 13,000 years ago? He said it was the Great Flood. 
And he explained that that was the flood recorded in every civilization nearly, and it was recording the final inundation of Atlantis. And he said that Noah was an Atlantean, the figure that we've come to know through the Bible, sort of legendarily as Noah, was an Atlantean. And he also said that the truest account of the flood is the Babylonian account of Gil Gilgamesh. But he said, we're again living at a time of Noah because we're reaching that point when there will be this great transition. Only this time will be like no others. This time will be that multidimensional ship where we will not die. But it's important for us to make it alive. And in the Bible, it said that 144,000 will make it. Well, thanks to all these multidimensional beings living among us who've maybe spurred on the New Age movement and the, way, the awakenings, there are going to be multi, you know, a multitude more than that. Most of humanity will be making it thanks to their efforts. Um, how do we achieve a level of awakening? You know, so many of us have. How do we recognize that? How, how do we achieve that? Well, a good clue is just our own inquisitiveness, our own ability to perceive that this day-to-day -day life going on around us is not it. Our own inquisitiveness to explore and look into these things is sort of an indication of our level of awareness. And also meditation really does help to raise your level, level of awareness. Um, I have a chapter in here on meditation and a specific type called transmission meditation where a great invocation is said first that really draws the high level beings to you. Is there a course or something that one can go on or is it all in the book? I sort of give a little instruction on it in my book. Um, and there, and I also list books and and things to go to find out more about it. But I do give an, give an instruction of it. Um, one of his classes, see, there's many, many things happening on this planet right now. And, the, and those are? Okay. One of his tremendous classes, they were all fascinating, every one of them. He began the class saying, looking out at us with his intense eyes and saying, Christ is returning in your lifetime, and his ancient soul name is Maitreya. It's very unfortunate that the name Maitreya among fundamentalist groups has got them all up in arms. They now, exactly, what does this mean to somebody who isn't aware of that? Are you talking about the Christ stories which go further into the past? I'm talking about the Christ, the being as Christ. And anyway, these fundamentalist groups have mistakenly equated it with a dark force, like the devil or something, but it isn't. Maitreya is the ancient name for Christ, the same Christ. Buddha is called um, Maitreya Buddha. The same Maitreya who overshadowed Buddha also overshadowed the man Jesus during those last three years from age 30 to 33. So the Christ is different from Jesus. They are two individualities. Jesus is living on the planet right now incognito as well as Maitreya. Um, my professor explained that it was discussed among this group that we know as the masters or the hierarchy whether or not Christ, aka Maitreya, would have to return in a physical body because, you know, as as uh, as much as this doesn't seem to make sense, it's very dangerous for a high being to come into a physical body because they're immediately at the mercy of dark forces that do anything to destroy their mission. So they could die, I mean, literally. Exactly. Could easy, Accidents. Easy, yeah, yeah. Accidents happen all the time. Um, despair, so many terrible things happening that some have been actually led to commit suicide, he, sa he stated, a few. Um, 
But at the time when it was decided that Christ would need to return in a physical body because of something tremendous happening in our future, 42 other masters volunteered. And he explained that they'll, they will be, and they are now, living among you incognito as human beings. So there's this factor as well as all these other multidimensional alien species, there's this other level of beings called the masters, the hierarchy living among us. <clears throat> and um, working all that they can so that this major transition goes smoothly. Like I said, it won't be just the 144,000 who make it mentioned in the Bible. It will be most of the planet's population. But the main thing to, to know, and that I want to get across in my book, I give many more details, but it is not going to be doom and gloom. There will I think be, that's very important. That's the fear agenda, the doom and gloom. Right. The fear. I, the book transcends the fear. The book is, everything else has been speculation and mostly negative. The book goes beyond that. Um, it is not going to be a fair scenario. Ex there will be a split in realities where, like I said, those who need the opportunity to still evolve more on this physical level will be given that opportunity. And if which, is, which is important. Right. And they will eventually come join us. But if your awareness, if your awakening, if you're watching this, good indication, is to that level of awareness that you're aware of these higher things, we will all be going to a different dimension, a different dimension of Earth. And he did is give... Is that a new Earth? Like right, the, the, this the is the Earth new is splitting Earth. off into... Or is, is there a new Earth being born within the Earth, or is there one there already? All right. This is the new Earth spoken of in the Bible. This is the new Earth spoken of by Eckhart Tolle. Um, this is what I've been given to, to understand, and I don't know if you want me to go into this other story of how I know. Let's go into the story. Okay. This is um, time to tell. Right. Like I said, my life has been one synchronicity after another. And um, 2007, June, I woke up in my bed and I knew. I knew that there were t three books waiting for me at a used bookstore called Frogtown, way across town, a bookstore I had never been to. Um, since a near-death experience, I don't drive, so I longed to go there because I love discovering things, but I had never been to this bookstore. I knew that two of them were about the masters, a subject which ever since my professor spoke about it, has intrigued me. And the third I knew was by Inga Swan, the man who developed the remote viewing system who I've since met. Well, Inga's books are out of print and some can sell for hundreds of dollars, so this was an exciting prospect. I got out to the bookstore. I said to the lady, where are your sort of spiritual metaphysical books? She said, go down to the third aisle, take a left, go all the way to the end, they're at the end. I went to the third aisle. I took a left. For some reason, I looked immediately left. My eyes fell on the spine of a book which had been out of order, waiting for me. It was called Extraordinary Times, Extraordinary Beings, Experiences of an American Diplomat with Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom by Wayne Peterson. I went on to find Letters of the Masters of Wisdom by the Theosophical Society. And, and I'm thinking now, okay, right. However, quite unlikely that I could find a book by Ingo, but I did. Develop Your Own ESP by Ingo Swan. So I get home and I start reading Wayne's book, Extraordinary Times, Extraordinary Beings. Intriguing book about him meeting the masters. Because like I said, they are living among us and they do need confidants and they do have confidants. A man named Benjamin Crum in the UK is a confidant of Maitreya, and he has spoken of it. Um, so I start reading the book. It's intriguing, but I don't have time. Months go by. I'm dashing out the door. 
my eyes catch the book and I bring it to read. As I'm reading it, he says he had been led to move to Las Vegas of all places. Well, it so happens that I'm going to, in October 2007, uh, a remote viewing conference in Las Vegas. So I'm whims whimsically thinking to myself, I would love to meet Wayne Peterson. If I can meet Wayne Peterson, I had to book my flight on orbits or something the following day to get the deal. I had to book it the next day. I'm thinking, if I could meet Wayne Peterson, I would book my flight in the morning for a day early to meet Wayne. But it was just a nonsensical thought. But as I'm reading, I keep reading, and he says, after he moved into this development that he was led to move into, he found that Danyan Brinkley lived there. Now, Danyan had three near-death experiences, was struck by lightning twice, I had already seen Daniel's story on TV and was familiar with him. But when he said that, that was another confirmation that there's something more going on here. There was some reason for me to find this book and there was some more connection because I'm flying home from Cairo, December 1999, middle of the night, over the Atlantic, the cabin's dark, everyone's asleep, I'm sitting on the right aisle I see a man coming back from first class on the left aisle. He crosses over to the right. I see that it's Daniel Brinkley. He walks back toward me. Coincidentally, there's an empty seat beside me. I scoot over. He sits down. We share near-death experiences. And, you know, I, I said I have this little bit of clairvoyance. I had this overwhelming feeling Danyan is now involved with helping with this whole process that's coming to earth I had this feeling that we we were joined because we are both playing a part in making people aware of what's going on he had been guided that there was a girl in the right aisle of the coach class that he was to meet and it was me so anyway, as I'm reading this in Wayne's book, here's the second coincidence. I, I'm thinking this is more than coincidence that all this has come about. So I get home, and like I said, I have to make my flight the next day, and I'm thinking, gee, I would love to meet Wayne, but possible to meet an author overnight. So I drop the book on the table and I get online. There was a man named Todd in Canada who years earlier I had emailed about my Maitreya. And, um, I said, Todd, I've just read Extraordinary Times, Extraordinary Beings by Wayne. I'm going to Vegas. I would love to meet Wayne Peterson. Lo and behold, Todd at that moment is online. So is Wayne. Todd and Wayne are good friends. Todd forwards my email to Wayne. Wayne emails me and invites me to dinner in Las Vegas. It was like boom, boom, boom. And so I'm sitting, Wayne picks me up at the hotel, whisks me off to the Bellagio, which is an otherworldly experience in itself, and we have a tremendous otherworldly conversation about what the masters have told him. And it all ties in with what's going to happen. And what is going to happen? Okay. Um, what, what they told him, and I asked his permission, to share this and he said I could share it at my discretion so I'm sharing it with you at my discretion um, he's they told him that on this split which we will all be taking a part of we will be going through the dimension of time as well as into a fi higher frequency dimension our bodies will no longer be quite as physical and in addition, we will be transferred 50,000 years into the future. And possibly, as I see it, return to the new earth, which is cleansed. Now, in my discussions with Dan, they told Dan that in the 60s that they had huge craft, bigger than some of our cities, miles wide, 
waiting in the rings of Saturn. And what's interesting now is that NASA has actually come out and said that there are anomalies in the rings of Saturn. They've seen them, but that's all they'll say is anomalies. Um, what, what was said is that they will be playing a part, that they have a key role in this big transition. There is a big transition coming. And that they will be taking the ones who are meant to make it across, to, uh, to traverse through these dimensions. Now, is this the mass landings, or what? Uh, this, what does you this know, mean? This is the thing, Miles. We don't know exactly how it's going to take place. If it's going to be a beam me up, Scotty type thing, you know, where like the two in the Bible, it says two are sleeping, one will be taken. If we're just going to be taken, um, I mean, the born again fundamentalists have a whole series called the um, what's Left Behind series on this very thing of they see of course it's all a fear-based series yeah, of yeah. you know people in piloting planes disappearing in crashes and the freeways cars crashing we don't know how it's going to happen but those who need to evolve more may simply pass in a major cataclysm or if they survive um, it will probably look like devastation to them but you know, most of us, I have reached the level of awareness of, um, you know, higher frequency that we will be making it consciously. The important thing is, he gave us indications of what to watch for, when, when things will begin to happen. Of course, I go into more detail in the book, and more is explained, as well as more fascinating conversations with Dan of what the aliens actually said. But uh, he said, there will be earthquakes that run across the lower Eurasian continent. And of course, I've watched them every time they've happened. And he said, what will really trigger it will be um, a major uh, volcano. Um, eruption of Vesuvius. Werner Glass in my classes in, in the mid-70s told us the key indicator that things are going to be happening will be the major eruption of Vesuvius and then you will know. He also now, indicated... Now we have a number of eruptions of, of Vesuvius every so often. Which one? Is there anything we could look for? All I know is it will be a very major one. However, this is important too. This is key also to, to understand in this whole scenario. Our point in time is like no other. Um, we know there is this thing called the matrix, AKA the Akashic Records, where everything is recorded. However, he explained this, this is fascinating. Having so many beings living among us, acting, you know, making their own decisions. It's like the, the scenario of us going back in time and changing things. They are changing the future. The future is no longer set in stone. The future, it, he explained, is always changing now. Since the presence of the Masters, which began in 1949, June of 1949, so the future is always changing. He said that the, he, he verified that Edgar Casey's uh, predictions were all valid, all true, but he said that they're off now in timing because of the, ma the presence of the masters. So now I am not quite sure if this scenario with the eruption of Vesuvius is still valid, actually. Things are changing as I see it. Um, our even being here now uh, is a testament to the Masters and how they have been working hard on our behalf. There have been so many close, you know, close calls to where we could have annihilated ourselves long before now. So keep this in mind. 
what I'm telling you it are good indications, and yet the Vesuvius thing could or could not happen. But he did give indications on how to prepare. And how is that? What can the average person do, and what do the average person should they look out for? All right. He said the important thing of this whole thing is don't get caught up in the fear thing at all. Okay? This is the important thing. View it as an adventure that we're all taking together. And it's going to be tremendous on the other side. View it as an adventure. Have your clan together who you are going to be with at this time. When you see these things start to happen, have it planned who you'll be with. Hopefully you'll be in a home with a fireplace. There'll be no electricity, no heat, um, no communications at all. But don't freak out. Don't be afraid. He said it was so important to remain happy. He said uh, to sing songs a lot, S tell stories, but singing songs and just being happy was the important thing. But another important thing was to close all your windows tightly with opaque fabrics. Even around your doors, about the bottom, if light comes in, use duct tape. Use duct tape all around your curtains. Do not be tempted to look out. There's a, there's a very fascinating video. At what time does one do that? Obviously, one has to come in and out of the house or whatever. Right. What, you right. know, when, when, when do we do that? What's okay. the time? There's a fascinating vi video by Michael Tessarion, T-S-A-R-I-O-N. He gives a lot of the information I have given from a scientific view. He gives that wheel of 25,920 years. He explains that we'll be going through a photon belt, which will, I, as I see it, could be the projector into the other dimensions. Now, you know, what he said kind of made me think of Lot's wife, who looked and was disintegrated. It's extremely important that even if we hear howling winds, things banging, we do not look out the window. That's an important key. Um, and there again, it could possibly be that we are taken before this. This was going to be, come to think of it, the three days of darkness that he was describing. Yes, and it's been mentioned that the, right, the, the, the three in, days in 2012, of darkness, the, right. There's a minister of Japanese government, or a, the royal family, I believe, has made, made some statement about three days of darkness. Okay, this is another YouTube that I want people to look at. If you, if you type in these four words, Princess Kaoru, K-A-O-R-U, a uh, mile-long last name beginning with N, Princess Kaoru uh, Pythagoras Conference, P-Y, T-H-A-G-O-R-U-S. Princess Kaoru explained that her third eye was open. In other words, she became clairvoyant. And of course, none of us knows the exact dates of this. But I'm just saying this could be another clue. Her, what she was given, is that the three days of darkness will begin on December 22nd. And, um, so I would, you know, I would suggest that you watch her video. But as far as timing goes, we don't know except to go by what she says. But the important thing for these three days of darkness is to be happy, remain clustered in your home, hopefully with a fireplace if you're in a cold zone, and just be happy. The main emphasis and message is that this is nothing to be afraid of. This is a transition that has happened regularly throughout time, but this will be like no other. And that there are many beings living among us who have been helping with this. And so, let's concentrate on the information people can get, specifically from your book, or any other sources that you feel that they would need to address. Right. The book gives much more information in detail, and it's information that people need to know now. Like I said, it's a different perspective. It's Everything else has been speculation. This is from 
the masters from clairvoyance, from the ability to know and to see what is coming and why. And it's really good to see that graph of the ages, of how we are going now from the Kali Yuga or the Piscean Age into the age of Aquarius. And it's this major transition that occurs regularly throughout time. Um, if you go to exploringsacredspace.com, you'll see the book and you'll be able to order it. And you'll also, there are links to the other interviews that I've had on it. I just interviewed last week with um, James Gilliland of ESETI, and I've also interviewed with uh, Regina of CMN.TV. But all the interviews will be given there. Um, I feel that it will be a, a good contribution of knowledge that we need to know for this year. Wonderful. Well, what sort of specific sections? How does the book uh, evolve? How does it um, bring you into what we need to know? It starts out with my classes at Waldorf. It explains in-depth information he gave us that we really need to know from a clairvoyant perspective. There are, there's a chapter on meditation as it goes on. There um, are a couple of chapters on my conversations in meeting Dan Fry, and then meeting the alien. What aliens did you meet? No race was mentioned, so I don't know what race it was. I, this I do know, though. Um, do you want me to go into when I actually met him? If that helps, yes. Well, they can read about it in detail in the book. But I will say this. I could see in this particular one that his hands from the forearm down had been altered to look human. This was way back in 1979, this was. Now I believe that they are more, you know, modified and look exactly like humans maybe even born into human hybrid bodies so that they don't need these surgical moderations but modifications but I could see that his arm from the forearm down had been altered that his real hand were hands were more like claws and his facial features had also been altered um, we had some amazing conversations and he spoke about your people your president and I thought that he knew that I knew who he was but anyway in the book it explains it explains the whole thing and I I eventually had them to dinner and what that was like did he like what you had to serve was he vegetarian no, it's all explained in the book, in the book. Um, okay I knew from the moment Dan mentioned that he was having a psychic surgeon come to town I knew that he was not from Earth. The sessions were to be three days in a row, and it was $100, which to a kid in their 20s in 1979 was a lot of money. But I signed up because I knew he was not from Earth. And that was verified when I saw his hands. I saw his high forehead. He spoke with an unusual lisp and walked with an incredibly smooth glide. And I could see around him that instead of any kind of a glow, there was a dark void. And that baffled me. Does because that thought it, send alarm bells up? Well, no, because there was no negativity about him. I was just sat there baffled and observed this because it was clearly a dark void, but there was no negativity. In fact, I felt, you know, good good feeling about him. So, as we close in this n nice day in Phoenix, in, in Arizona, at the International UFO Congress, what are your parting feelings and uh, final comments? Uh, you know, as futuristic, as sci-fi as it sounds, there is a transition coming. And people just need to know that this is going to be a different one, and but there's nothing to be afraid of. And the important point is not to freak out when it starts happening, 
but to sort of seclude yourself and just be happy and let it blow over. Well, thank you very much You're and welcome. blessings. The, the painting I did, it's an oil painting, it's 42 inches wide and um, I covered the book with it. The, the painting is called Sacred Space and the book is Exploring Sacred Space. And you can see more details about it at exploringsacredspace.com. This is it for right now. I've written little pamphlets on, and given talks on uh, explaining meditation, explaining the masters that I've just handed out, but I've never really published a book till now. So what inspired you to write this book? What was the main thing? I realize Pete, there's so much about 2012 and the transition that I recognize as just fear-based things that aren't even true, that aren't even truly what is happening with this. And I realize that with all this that has come my way, it has all happened to me and come cross paths for a purpose. And I needed to get this information out. Miriam, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. We're in. Can I close? Yeah, no, I'm. Um, oh, you have to. To get the secret DVDs out of the secret car. And what are you here for? <laughs> well, I'm still f trying to figure out <laughs> why I'm here. <laughs> but that's the fun. That's the fun part of it. Any major statements to humanity? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How come I keep saying hiya to everybody? Thoughts of wisdom. <laughs> hiya. Oh, hiya. Silbury Hill. <laughs> oh, oh God. It's like a fox is trailing me. Full. And the energies are nice. I don't know. I like the energy here, but I don't know what's bull. That's that's something I have to look into later. I just follow my first impulse and says bull. There are so many made up stories. And but you were specifically saying about the I think it's about time to let go of all those stories. But what's left if we leave the stories behind? That's intriguing. So what stories are you specifically making reference to? All the stories we heard this morning. All the stories you were telling. All the stories that I was well, telling. Well, a specific reference to this sign that you said is bull. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Because I didn't even have my glasses on, so I didn't. The way it was made? Yes. So what are you saying? I think it would be really nice to admit that we've been working with nature's forces in a much better and healthier way than we are doing now. Might just be nice to admit that we are just part of it. Show a little, um, what do you call that? Respect. Respect and uh, <laughs> How do you call that? Respect for nature? No. Hum Humility. Humility, yes. But to, in the, for me, in, you know, admitting that we're just part of it, being a little, showing some humility, makes me bigger. That's the fun part of it. So that's what I like.
That's true. You like the energies here? Yes. Although I feel like it's, I, I like to be on the other side between West Kent Long Barrow. Yeah. To feel the triangle. To be in the triangle here between Silbury Hill, Avery, and but the West Kennet That's that's oh that's up here. Okay. Oh it's here. Where's the best place to be? Here. That's basically the car park. Almost, yes. But further south. Just south of the car park. But there is an energy center of healing and goodness. Is there? Yes. You know that? Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. Well, you found something out. Intuitively. I guess. Because if you're there, you see, it's in the fields here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now are you talking north of the road or south of the road? No. No, it is here. You you go up up to the Long Barrel. Barrel. Yeah. Just as the river, or. And it's a bit up there as well. No, but it's here. Yes. No, it's south. I have to sense it. Yeah. Can we go there? Yeah. Okay. It feels like, you know, if you can really um, tune into that, you get rid of the stories. And the stories are like luggage. And they're getting heavier. The luggage is getting heavier. I don't like the weight of the stories anymore. No. We need to move faster without the stories. Okay, I'll talk to you up there. Okay. Yeah? They have been dancing along the, the stones from Avebury. The, the stones from Avebury? Well, you got those roads, the legs from Avebury, where the men and the women went. We've been women at the same time. We've been dancing there. I feel like I'm among relatives here, which is. Nice, special. On some of the lines you can feel it easier. So try to stand on a earth grid line. So I can feel the connection better. With all the, the old lines in the earth. But we've been here before. But you were a woman. And so was I. But we knew how to dance. We enjoyed it. We did. The fact that we are here together again, it's meaning we're among relatives in many different layers. It's part of what started us off. And let's go to the other side. <laughs> Daisies. <laughs> Big daisy. And the healing tree behind us. We talk to her? Yeah. Good.
respects to this old lady. Couldn't do it. I mean, so we did. <laughs> she said, Mary, we can talk a lot about trust, but just bend over and give in and <laughs> do it yourself. <laughs> it's the spirit of the tree said that. Yeah. Or at least I used the tree as an antenna to get to me. So, I apologize, I'm full of bullshit as well. <laughs> and you know what? I don't care. Five years ago? No, ten years ago. There was a checkerboard type crop circle there. And I drove there with my black car, made this in. And I was there with my friend Alice, who I married. And planes overhead, and the Daily Mail took a picture. It was in the Daily Mail the next day. <laughs> the only time I ever got into page three of a newspaper. <laughs> I'd like to take some of mine.
think we should go and get ourselves a cup of tea. Well, Miriam, what's your verdict on this crop circle, the first one we've been in in 2011? <laughs> it's a bit messy. <laughs> but I love standing on the hillside, though. It's messy. Tonight, we have Eclipse of the Moon, rising, eclipsed. Isn't that a thrill? What time is the eclipse? It would be 9.15. And this clock is still saying one hour in GMT, so it's in less than three hours. Two hours, really. That means we've got about two hours of daylight. Seconds to get it to work. I see my hair <laughs> yeah. in front of the lens, that's good. Yeah. There what it goes, there it goes. Some of the parts of the crop circle felt different from the other, which was remarkable. Hello, darling. Pardon? Is this Mr. Johnson in full gear? 
Did uh, it? You're referring to my uh, executive style sun repellent, huh? The camera experience I had. On the tour at Glastonbury? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then we went on St. Michael's Church. And if you concentrated on the, the connection between the tour and St. Michael's Church, it really sends it. And a moment like this, I always ask myself, am I imagining things? But it, what's the nice thing if you're there with a, a few people that sense the same thing, you know, it's, it's enhances the field. So if your senses get better, and you can check it amongst each other. Really nice. Really. Looks like we're right here. I guess. You pointed out with behind the barn. I see. That's the you wanna go first? Yeah. My ears hurt. My ears hurt as well. Kind of dense air. I don't know how to express it. I feel very similar. I've got the uh, ears. Looks feels very dense. you mean by the stories going on? Well, the stories, you know. People telling that every crop truck is being handmade, human made. There's no real significance to the circles anymore. But then still, I can walk up the line and think, why this location? So there must be something that's pointing out this location. It might just be the location that's important, not even the circle. Because it's really getting our feet deep into the earth. I, that means something to me. And then we're at the center here, which is fairly messed up. Very. How much time does it take to get this messed up? I mean, uh, it would take one group of people just sitting here for one day, but for, uh, I mean, all these walk through paths look like that, you know, whatever's really going on here. Well, there was this big circle. Mm. And this pattern. Yeah, that's this. So there was a circle. Oh, well, that wasn't crushed in the original one. No. But still, the pattern inside looks very irregular. Yeah, it looks just messed up by a bunch of guys with a rope. Yeah. And this one doesn't look nice at all. Different sun angle. There's two people, I think there's some people in the middle there, which have been, there's a fairly high, uh, yeah. fairly low sun angle. Sitting looking from the East Kennet Crop Circle at West Kennet Long Barrow, and to the right is 
silvery hill, which is out of vision. Why? Just the long barrel here. This is a new one for me, too, because, you know, it's... Hmm, I was about to say it's not my country, but it's a weird thing to say because it's my country as well. Um, maybe it's not my country in the sense of being my home country in this life, but still, I got some roots around here, so... I'll just ask if I can get an answer from the question why is the Longborough, West Kennet Longborough, placed here? It faces west, east. As a matter of fact, it has a connection with all the directions. It has been there before Avebury, before Silbury before most of the megalith standards, standing stones in the surroundings. Before it was the shape it has now, it has been much smaller and used on a far more festive way than it's used now. Um, and we feel a bit sorry for the people who gather here now because there are such sadness and distrust among them and we never had that when we were celebrating our ritual feasts there at the time we built this we constructed it with the help of the elves the earth energies and the spirit guides that told us how to construct it in such a way that it could last a really a long time the place that you've been standing in yesterday was built on later and was built as a kind of protection room because there had been a lot of uh, misuse of the spaces uh, we really planned this place to be a place of celebration and the things that happened afterwards were not celebrating. Nevertheless, you ask us why it's placed here, it's because through the earth it has a connect connection right away with some other um, portals on the earth crossed on the other side of the earth. So there, if you go through the earth there will be another spot on the other side of the earth, but it will, within the earth there will be connections with other places. So we were basically a stationary to direct the crystal waves that would be sent out. And that's why um, Miriam <laughs> is here now to talk to the crystal specialist Miles Johnstone. Yeah, yeah! He knows about broadcasting tuning, fine tuning, and he will need his intuitive abilities far more than he did up till now and use all the things that he has been gaming with, playing with in a serious manner, but still uh, keep the sense of play. If you come back to the long barrel be aware of the fact that there are connections with crystal, so to speak, radio stations on other places in England, but further on to France, Italy, uh, Egypt, and uh, on the, more in the direction of the North Pole, where there's no North Pole anymore, but there used to be. And you will pack up information that will help you get your jobs straight because you want to work as an engineer on uh, this broadcast 
show that we're gonna put up next year. You wanna be part of it. You will be part of it. Still, it might be useful to clear some of the stuff that you have in your house so it will be more obvious to us that we are welcome in your house to be working on this new job instead of spending any energy on getting away for all jobs. I think, we think you did a great job yesterday night in clearing old energies and making the pathway free for absolutely new challenging situations. The buzz in your ears is a signal that there is a possibility to broadcast for us. So if you feel this, be aware of our presence. Don't let it bother your ears, just let it make you aware and then the pressure will fall away and you're more in your body, you're more into your presence and we can reach out to you more easily. The crop circle here is not of much value but it's still it's nice to be here because it is a good location to be connected with the longer. And Miriam, your arse is really on the right spot in this circle. <laughs> Oh gosh. Well done. My dearest Miles, do not hesitate in accepting our gratitude and do trust Miriam, please. She is a nice and trustworthy person, although you will doubt that once in a while. I kept you safe until now and from now on you will be able to join forces with the people, the entities that will guide you towards your new job. So you will be helping to get broadcasting around the world concerning health care, care of nature, supply of natural sources and energy management in a higher frequency dimension. Beware, beware, beware. Bold people have a tendency to burn their head. Guard you for the sun. Love you. Uh, Miriam, are you saying that those higher, higher energy and higher being? highly evolved and wonderful beings are calling me a fucking slaphead. <laughs> uh, 